today I wanted to go through what I saw through the orbital diagrams of Comet Ice on a similarity that was between Ed Dame's hand-drawn sketch of the kill shot that did it in a remote viewing session. And if you believe in the electric universe, there's no way you can discount that comets do electrically affect the sun and plasma discharge. And you'll always notice where the comet goes, the CME follows. The kill shot Ed Dames refers to is a really incredibly large coronal mass ejection that takes down the electrical grid on the planet, or at least parts of it, on our Earth. So you might ask yourself, would there be an advanced warning? And the answer is yes, but we need to look back in history to ancient cosmology when we do have stories of dragons in the sky. The dragons are nothing more than plasma discharges from planet to planet, or either comet to planet, or something from the sun to the planet to the comet, like we're about to witness and we've seen happen with, with Mars in the first week of October and the last couple of days of September. Taking a look at the orbital diagram of Ison as it passed directly over the north pole of Mars around 7 million miles above the North Pole. As you can see what Mars looked like before the electrical event. As you can clearly see as the Birkeland currents activated from the Sun out 146 million miles to the North Pole of Mars in conjunction with the electric comet. The electrical interaction across space are termed Birkeland currents and obviously they did activate at this time when the magnetic north conjuncted with the comet itself and something activated from the Sun and indeed those currents did start flowing. There's a lot of different pictures, nothing from NASA, nothing from the European Space Agency, nothing from any governments. All these pictures that you're going to find about the coma forming and the electrical interaction are off different Earth-based telescopes, people's cameras, sightings, and people just like you and me who actually went outside, saw this event, and took photos. As we can see, I'm just going to let them run here. There's quite a few. Uh, I like the New Mexico telescope there. People trying to work with Photoshop to differentiate the different tones to show the coma. These three images come from the Curiosity rover, unprocessed images, but look at the top there. It looks as if the coma from the comet itself is in the, uh, some sort of line of light across. Obviously, that's the interaction electrically that they're catching on film, as well as some sort of cloud bank has formed on the planet. Was there an evaporation of some of the water and carbon dioxide on the planet because of the interaction and uh, in, in the plasma state that actually released that into the gaseous state and now recondensed into clouds. Notice the spike in energy density from the sun discharging during the same exact days that the comet was over the north pole of Mars. Another electrical discharge phenomenon was on Jupiter's moon Io. It was the largest eruption that astronomers had witnessed and it was about the same distance from the sun to Mars as the comet was to Jupiter when the eruption happened. Ison was on the way to Mars when this happened on August 15th. Coincidental or not? No, I think it's an electrical interaction between all the bodies and Ison itself. Now back to the kill shot. Would we have some warning? And I believe we will. I believe we're going to see something in the heavens that has not been witnessed for about 4,000 years. If we take a look at their ancient cosmology, there's a lot of representations of stars, dragons, things that connect. Plasma discharge is represented as mythical beings that could be no other way explained 4,000 years ago before we have the technology that we have currently. Taking a look at the orbital diagram, you can see how the comet is on the outside of Mercury, directly facing the Sun, and Mercury is kind of a sandwich between those two electrical forces there in itself. If you notice, the graph shows the density is far higher with Mercury than it was with Mars, especially with the inner core being made so much of iron and nickel, and the, the percentage of the core itself is far higher than it was with Mars. So you would expect there to be a much greater electrical interaction with Mercury, especially in that specific spot it's in. In order to see this precursor event, you'll have to be up around 5 or 5.30 in the morning looking toward the east directly as Mercury is rising. What I believe we're going to see is some radial discharge and some sort of plasma discharge streamers traveling between the Sun, Mercury, and the comet itself. Now, as you notice here, again, mythologically, when we come through, the dragon is represented, and I think that is the energy streaming between the two. And when it gets out of control and it's incredibly heavy, you start to get what look like the legs coming off there as a discharge out, almost like lightning would do on our own planet. This interaction with Mercury will give us a good idea what will be happening with the effect on Earth because the distance is similar. It's about 29 million miles to Mercury, and if we do see any effects and what I believe is going to be common ice on connecting with Mercury and then connecting with the sun below the horizon, it'll be during the daytime as well as it comes over during the, the sunrise. 
whatever the interaction might be between the planet and the comet itself connected by the sun we're going to experience something similar. The distance isn't exactly that far away. Although Mercury is closer to Ison, 29 million miles compared to 42 million miles, you know, in space, that's very little distance between the two. So you can get a rough idea about the discharges that we'll experience here on Earth, as well as the disruption to the electrical grid and the satellites. It's a good way in advance to see what's coming, and that might explain the government shutdown and why they're keeping everybody out of the national parks, because as you know, a lot of people plan if it gets bad to head into nature. What's the best way to keep them out? You close it so they can't get there when something does happen. Now in the last image I've included here, you can see this was the maximum discharge uh, during the comet experience over the Mars North Pole. Now if we take that at 7 million miles and we divide that by 42 million, that's a simple 7. So if we decrease the action and activity by 7 times, or even if it's exponential and we decrease that by 49 times, and still put those same parameters on the Earth and our electrical grid and electrical system, what effect would that have? And that's truly the question you need to ask, especially if there is some interaction between Comet Ison and our own electrical field on the Earth. Faraday cage might be the answer, actually. Okay, to wrap things up here, keep your eyes pointed toward the eastern horizon between, let's say, November 12th and November 18th. What you see up there happening is going to be reflective of what will come by here another month later onto our little blue planet. Good luck. Good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to thank those of you who took a look at my video talking about the interaction of Comet Ison and Mercury over the last few days. I think you have a lot of valuable information off of there. When I was trying to discuss the electric universe, what I wanted to do was show you the next electrical event that's going to happen in our skies. The comet over the next few days, specifically on the 19th, 20th, and 21st of October, is going to pass directly between the Earth and Mars along our orbital plane. Now, those of you, including myself, who believe in the electric universe theory, that 99.999% of our visible universe is plasma, and also the understanding that the behavior of the sun and the stars can be influenced by electrical comets by way of interplanetary plasma filaments, also aligning with the field currents of different planetary bodies such as the Earth, comets, our Sun itself. We'll definitely want to take note over the next coming week about the electrical activity between the Sun and the comet. I believe as well that what's going to happen is we will see some sort of electrical interaction between the Sun and the comet and also a smaller T-junction between Mars, the comet, and the Earth. Now if we think about kilovolt lines on the planet ourselves, that would be Specifically, what I'm talking about from the sun to the comet, we're going to get some sort of very large streamer coming off of there, visible or not. And then from there, it's going to conjunct with the comet and then split off and T-junction into Mars as well as the Earth. Now, not talking doom and gloom, but you would expect the result of a higher electrification current going through in our field lines to generate earthquakes on the planet. Earthquake, I'm not sure the exact size, but look for an uptick, maybe possibly something much larger that would make international news. That's the effect. The cause is the electrification of the Birkeland currents activating to more highly energize these bodies in the plasma in space conjuncting together. As you can see in the image, Norwegian explorer and physicist Christian Birkeland imitated some experiments that he, through using a, a compass on the North Pole, our auroras were specifically generated from the sun electrically. If we take a look at this, we also can talk about free energy from Nikola Tesla's wireless transmission through space itself drawn from the sun. Now, if this is true, and we take a look at Jupiter, what type of currents would it take? What massive amount of power would it take from that distance from the sun to electrify Jupiter to create those large auroras on the surface. Now, as we take a look at these next pictures of, from SOHO, I think we would start to see some similarities between the plasma discharge and the currents opening up. These are quite visible. Will something visible happen during this exchange or not? But again, what you're looking for is the electrical disturbance that will cause larger earthquakes on our planet. As we get into the orbital diagram, you can see the, the specific lineup that I'm referring to. When we come on to today's viewing from the SDO, you start to see that the sunspots on the western quadrant down there should somehow connect and we'll see something either visibly or as an effect magnetically that we cannot see in the form of an earthquake on the planet. A cause and effect relationship. I'm trying to point out 
it's not about the earthquake that would be generated. It's more about the currents that are generated that would generate the earthquake. And if this is true, everything you've ever learned about renewable power is completely wrong, that there's free power around us all the time. And again, I will say, when Nikola Tesla was talking about drawing electricity out of space itself to power all the devices we use around us in our daily lives, you need to keep that thought in mind and take that with you while you go through your day. Thanks for watching. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'd like to discuss with you the internet blackout that Time Warner experienced in the Northeast United States from October 19th to the 21st. I had also theorized that the conjunction of Mercury, Comet Ison, the Earth, and the Sun would have some electrical effect that might create more earthquakes or create some electrical disturbance on our planet. Simply take a look at the T-junction I was mentioning. It's along the orbital plane. You'll see how it does match up into a T there. What I had predicted on the 17th was the sunspots 1861, 1870 would start cracking and would flare off to electrically connect with Comet Ison. You can see the energetic field lines that I thought would metamorphosize. And you can see they did in actuality connect to the comet, I believe. As you can see, the magnetic field lines that we have that come off of our Earth could easily connect to something in the neighborhood, if you will. Now let's talk about the northeastern blackout of 1965. It's in the exact same area. Again, it's repeated in 1989 with the solar disturbance in Quebec. And if we fast forward to 2003, again, we, we find the same area had some electrical disturbances that caused blackouts. Is it coincidence that this internet blackout was in the exact same area when the T-junction occurred with Comet Ice on Mars and the Earth? This is a November 3rd view. We'll have another lineup along the orbital plane with Comet Ice on the Earth. Mercury this time along with the Sun. So let me say in advance, I do feel from, let's say, November 1st through November 5th, or a week and a half from now, we should experience another electrical disturbance somewhere on our planet an uptick in earthquakes. The comet is closer to the sun at that time, meaning it's more energetically charged. It's more a cosmic capacitor. And you would definitely expect something like this to be more highly energized as it gets closer to the sun. I encourage you to do some of your own research to see how comets really do interact in our electrical universe. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video today. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we are going to take a look at the triangle conjunction coming up on November 3rd connecting in a triangle alignment between Comet Ison, the Earth, Mercury, and the Sun. Now, as we approach the alignment, I've been asked, what can you expect to see? You know, we're talking about all these celestial events and plasma discharges from the Sun, but what can you physically see? I've been asked that question, so I'm going to tell you right now. This video is going to encompass these five different points. Stronger auroras, noctilucent clouds, an increase in frequency of sprites or upper atmospheric lightning, radial signal interference and disruption, and stranding of animals that use magnetic field lines to navigate. You'd also want to take a look at the Lasco C2 images. You'll start to see more jets and filaments pulling out of the right side of the sun, which is actually the western part as the sun spins in the opposite direction as the Earth. Look to the right side or the western side. You should see a lot more activity from that same exact area because that's where the comet is coming in from. So that's the first key, the Lasco C2. Always notice that there'll be something pulling out of the west or the right limb. A quick look at the orbital diagram without the lines drawn. You can see the exact flat plane that we're talking about. Now there will be more charged particles coming down through our magnetic field lines. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. The charged particles actually stream in. Now these charged particles normally only come from the sun. One direction, if you will. With the comet off, creating this triangle formation, the comet will electrically connect to the sun and then connect back to the Earth along our field lines. So we're actually going to have two lines of current coming in, if you will. I've noticed a pattern with the auroras over the North Pole of our planet. Heavy intensity of geomagnetic storms seem to center themselves over North America and Canada. Now, if you expect there to be a double electrification coming in from two sets of electrical bodies, I would bet it that the electrical disturbance and internet connections that will go down first on our planet would be in this specific area here. And there's several examples. Again, it's always in the same place. Notice that. Watching off the western limb of the sun or the right portion of the sun in this Lasco C2 image, 
you would expect to see more coronal mass ejections flung in this direction as well. Now, if we look at the conjunction of Comet Ison over the North Pole of Mars, notice the time date stamp on these images from Lasco. Look at the coronal mass ejection, that, that plasma filament that erupted the exact same days that Comet passed over the North Pole of Mars and created a coma. Now here's the interesting thing. We have some pictures from amateur astronomers of this coma forming over Mars, but during that same time the government was shut down in the United States and there's not even a single image, not even one image from a satellite to show this coma forming from an international space agency of this particular event. What's also to take note of is there were only three images released from the Curiosity rover during this Passover. This is one of the most interesting ones that I was able to dig out. This came from somebody as an unprocessed photo. During the government shutdown, these photos were released on the web. There were three pictures, and that is it. This one shows some sort of light beam or Birkeland current opening up, reconnecting back to the sun. So that's what we get for all of our billions of dollars in the space program from around the world space agencies. A Curiosity rover picture and no pictures of satellites looking at the coma across Mars with the electrical interaction. I think they didn't really want you to see that because you're going to start putting two and two together just like I do by using the simple orbital diagram provided by JPL and Solar System Scope. Every time you can find planets that are in alignment, you could theorize that if there's an electrical current from the comet itself, then it would energize those field lines especially in this T-junction that I said on the 19th through the 21st would have some electrical phenomenon happen on our planet. Again, let's take a look at the timestamp on the Lasco C2. This is a CME that was Earth-directed during the exact same day of that T-junction alignment on the 19th and 20th of October. Notice how that flared out and came directly at the Earth. Now in the western quadrant of the sun, you'll notice the yellow circle. That's where you would start to see a lot of energy emanating from lines, filaments pulling out from the sun to connect to the comet through a now visible Birkeland current because it's more energized and that plasma is actually allowing you to see it with your physical eyes. Down where the circle is, that's where the comet will actually pass up and around the sun, so you will definitely notice more activity in that area. Here are two examples of what I'm talking about. Notice on the 21st and the 26th, those two plasma filaments coming out and drawing toward the comet. And as the field lines continue to connect to Comet Ison, what you would expect is more electrified space, if you will, connecting to our planet. And I think that happened during the 19th and caused the internet blackout of Time Warner in that same area of the United States. If we do look at these blackouts that have occurred, in North America, the Northeast American blackout of 2003, notice where it's at, same place as the internet blackout. If we jump back in time and we go back to 1965, the Northeast American blackout is the same. And if we talk about the Canadian blackout of 1989 caused by a solar storm, they all seem to emanate and focus over the same area. Another sign you would look for is radio blackouts and radio disturbances as the X-class solar flares start to interact with our own atmosphere. This did happen on October 25th, and radio communications were lost on the sun-facing side of the planet for 15 minutes. And as we enter this conjunction on November 3rd through November 8th, the comet should brighten significantly. As you notice, uh, a quick look at Halley's Comet and Temple 1. The electrical emanations are quite visible from both of those. Well, it's actually with every comet, not just these two. The next thing to watch for would be with increased geomagnetic storms and more highly charged auroras. You should start seeing auroras in different places and locales across the planet that you don't usually see them much further south than usual. This would be a precursor. Now notice red. Red is more intensity. So if you're seeing red auroras down in Cuba, Everything north of there would have either its power disrupted or circuitry would have been damaged. Another occurrence that will become more visible would be the upper atmospheric lightning. They're termed sprites. They're about 90 kilometers in the atmosphere down to about 30 kilometers. And generally you'll find them over electrical storms on our own planet. It's just a conduit between space itself down to our first electrical magnetic field. You'll start to see more of these right around the first and second weeks of November, you would expect that if everything is becoming more highly energized, sprites would become more visible. And if we take a look, they do sort of look like mythical lightning bolts and things that we've seen through history. Uh, are we starting to see a repeat of this? Is this where their legends came from? And I'm starting to think that yes, we are about to repeat a 4,000 year cycle. 
and we ourselves will be carving things in stone because this is going to be such a special, incredible moment. Now, another thing you would take notice of that should start making worldwide news would be noctilucent cloud sightings. Again, it's just the excitation of nitrogen that creates the deep blue color, but with more energy flow coming in, these cloud areas should also be more excited and they should be more visible in the spectrum with our eyes that we can see as these plasma currents energize our atmosphere. And finally, for those of you that are viewing the Lasco C2 images to try to find some sort of pattern, notice that there's a missing five hours during the last event where the plasma current was coming off the western limb pulling toward the comet. You notice that the last image is around 9.13 and the next image we receive doesn't occur until almost 1.30. Timestamp, where are the missing five hours? I actually want to see that. I want to see those images myself. You should be asking the same questions. And for those of you trying to understand the electric universe better and the possibility of free power existing around us that can actually be pulled from space itself, there's a great book called The Electric Sky. I highly suggest that you would take a read through it. Donald Scott is the author. And my final thought for today is take a look at the picture. You'll notice it looks like a dragon coming out of the sun. And in my first video, Comet Ison and Mercury's Electrical Phenomenon, November 12th through November 18th of 2013, Return of the Mythical Plasma Dragons, these are exactly the types of things I'm talking about. But this will pull much further out to connect with Mercury as well as back to the comet itself. So these would be many plasma filaments coming off. I'm talking something that's 60 million miles long that's going to be coming off of the sun at this time. So this is what you can expect to see beginning over the next three weeks. Take note and stay informed. Thanks for watching. I'm a skeptic about the ISON comet and I have a couple of questions. Why should I or anybody care if this comet is circling the sun and it's going to increase radiation on Earth? You know, that's a great question, and I've asked myself that. Knowing about some renewable energy in the electric universe, uh, I believe our fragile electrical grid is not as protected as it could be, and that some yeah, geomagnetic storm could have some electrical disturbance on our planet. It depends if that radiation is accompanied by electricity as well. All right, the last time, a big one to look up that's proven... We can go to Google as the Carrington event in 1859, and that happened in Michigan, right? Well, it actually happened in far more places than that. Yeah, so let's step back to the 1859 Carrington event. It actually occurred in September, and it was far wider ranging than, than you've just said. It was not just in one single location. So what happened? Well, let's compare 1860s telegraph lines, the chunky huge iron devices that click the wire da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. let's compare it to something like our ipads or mac air how what's the fragility of that that was an incredibly hefty system at that time and the basic answer to that is our lifestyle is so based on this fragile electrical grid it's not protected from what you're talking about increased radiation or electrical pulses from the sun if it's all connected to the grid? For how long? Well, how long would it be during a typhoon or a hurricane? And how long does it take to repair all that before your electricity is restored? At the minimum, you could expect that. Do you have a refrigerator? I do. If it stops, what do you do at that point? And it would stop because of an electrical surge? That's right. Now, if you notice when power surges come, it's a trip event. So... It's not exactly the entire grid's affected, but it starts in one place and spreads to the rest of the grid. So even if you're hundreds of miles away and an electrical event happens because of a large solar flare concentrating someplace on the planet that supplies you with the electricity, yours goes out even if you're hundreds of miles away. Now you're saying that this happened in 1859 and it was caused by the electrical universe theory, EUT? Uh, we call it EU. It's the electric universe theory, of course. Uh, comets are electric. They're almost cosmic capacitors. They interact with the sun electrically. I mean, gravity's part, yes, but electrical connection as well. And also the sun reacting with comets electrically to cause more coronal mass ejections. All right, so you're basing all of your projections and warnings on something called the Carrington event. 
the world's largest geomagnetic storm that was measured by modern instruments. Right. And what, what was the effect of the telegraph lines during that time? It melted them? It nope. didn't melt as in turn them into liquid, but they all caught on fire. They caught the poles on them that were on fire. And also at the stations where they have that really clunky, duh, 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 like pieces of metal, sparks were flying out a meter, three, four feet out of where they actually put the signal in and burned some of the operators because the sparks were but coming out that, that far. Where did that happen? In the United States and in Europe, both. Station would catch on fire at that time, but what about the electrical devices we have in our house now? What about those main currents that are coming back in? What if each one of those starts to shoot out of flame? At least the plastic covering will catch on fire in your house. All right, so what should we do? Unplug the refrigerator? Unplug the microwave? Because this is in the air. This is not coming just across electrical wires, right? That's right. It's in both. But you could actually cut yourself off from the house if you turned off the power going into your house and actually disconnected that grid with no physical connection to it. So there was literally a fire break between your house and the grid. That would give you some time, but you're right. Electric universe theory talks about there's electrical plasma in all space, and all we have to do is draw that energy out of space itself. Nikola Tesla talked about this in 1880s, 1890s. If you're seeing red auroras in Cuba... Everything else north in Ohio and around to New York, is their instrumentation is being destroyed. All right, you began by asking me, do I have a refrigerator? So I should unplug my refrigerator. I certainly want to unplug my high-priced computer. I mean, really, we're just, we'll are just we have to ride this out, won't we? You do have to be disconnected from the electrical grid somehow. The plasma charge is actually in the air itself. It's not only from the sun. The Everything around you is plasma. You live in a universe that's full, complete. It's 99.9% energy itself that's vibrating faster because the comet's electrically connected to the sun, and those electrons and protons are more highly charged. There's more of them coming at us, and we get more highly charged. And that affects the electrical systems. Things can be plugged in. Or they can be not plugged in. Which one? If you have a lightning strike on your house, would you want your computer plugged in the wall where there's way extra electricity coming in your house through those? You didn't want it to, but it got hit by lightning, so everything got overcharged. Bzz. Do you want your things plugged in during a lightning storm that gets hit by, or do you want them unplugged? I want them unplugged. Why don't people know about this? Why, why isn't this as big a deal as the uh, news portrays it to be? <laughs> or the 2000, what was that called? Where the computers weren't going to work? Y2K. Y2K. Yeah, why, why isn't there as much panic or as much worry about this as Y2K? This one's real. Why isn't there media reports everywhere and warnings? Well, it has been spoken about on some of the news channels, especially I like this Brian Williams clip. It was about 45 seconds. I think he says, there's a big, bright, brilliant comet coming in November... You may want to stock up on snacks and beverages. Was that a subliminal way to tell people? But you're, you're saying that what happened, the Carrington event, could happen again in a much greater degree in November, December of 2013. And to prove your point, you're saying it's already begun. In October 19th through the 21st, there were some events that happened on the Earth because of the comet Ison. That's correct. There was a T-junction between Mars, Comet Ison, and Earth that also connected back to the Sun. Now, I was saying that because it's an electrical universe that the Sun is pulling to Comet Ison out to space, that these Birkeland currents would be more electrified and there would be but some you, electrical no, disturbance. No I predicted more earthquakes during that time. You can't tell me that November 19th through November 21st, the Internet went down in the Northeast United States. And November 19th through November 21st, when I predicted, and the orbital diagrams, they show that the connection was there mathematically. So what's the coincidence of these mathematical probabilities happening that overlap in time, the 19th to the 21st?
Hi, this is the uh, skeptic, and we're talking with Plasma Dave about the uh, Isone comet that may or may not, well, be affecting us and will affect us through December. All right, Plasma Dave, you say that people can find proof of the effects of this plasma from the week of October 23rd through October 29, 2013. Prove it. Will science work and mathematical fact, would that be enough for you? Or should we just work from conjecture and speculation? Which one would you like? Whatever, just prove it. Now let's start back at Lasco C2 images. You'll notice over that entire last week, every single day, several times per day, there were either coronal mass ejections coming off the right side of the sun. There were either filaments that were pulling out. If you notice in a couple of the photos here, there's specific, you can definitely see the filaments pulling out of the equator there. Also, you would expect to see more energetic lightning, something called sprites. It's upper atmospheric lightning between 30 and 90 kilometers above. Uh, the last thing you also, we're going to look for more radio outbursts and more radio uh, disruption if you will, over the next couple of weeks as well. The protons come in, they act like a sponge. They actually soak up the radio signal. So the more of them come in and the wider the layer is, the less radio frequency can actually go through that layer. Protons are sponges. They take up radio signal. So sprites, radio signals, and more flares coming from the right side or western limb of the sun, especially along the equator or just north of that to about 40 degrees or south of that. Filaments, plasma filaments. But, all right, well, you could prove that if someone comes to you and says, come on, you're using... Well, why would I do that? Why don't you take a look at some of your own information? We have something called the Internet. You can look and back up and verify any of these facts. So you're saying, all right, so the activity that, that's happening, if, we're, if I'm looking at the sun, look to the right-hand side, and it's really noticeable this activity is happening. That's right. It's, the right side is actually the western quadrant of the sun, and the sun spins in the opposite orbit as ourselves. So the west is actually the east, and the east is actually the west, which is the right side. So when you look there, you're looking just like our own planet. There's an equator, a front line. You're going to look for more of those things shooting out, whether it's a coronal mass ejection or a filament. It looks like a piece of string that's highly energized, very kind of yellowish-red that will pull off of the sun. Uh, there were 26 eruptions in the last week during that time of M and X-class flares. There were four X-class flares. Can I click on I don't want to leave YouTube. Can I click on a link and see it? You sure can. If you take a look below, it'll take you to the direct Alaska C2 satellite feed where you can put in movies and make that work on your own. You can enter the dates. Make sure you press the movie circle at the bottom. Press set, and they're ready to go, and it'll load up all those photos, up to about 500 photos. That'll turn into a quick movie for one minute, and you can see the eruptions yourself, and you can watch the sun in real time every seven minutes. Or so. And the second way to prove this is through radio signals. If you go to the Space Weather Alerts and Warnings timeline in the NOAA website, you can find a 15-day plot that they track every solar disruption, solar flare, uh, radio X events, any types of, of space weather. It's all plotted into a table. And there's one specifically called radio events. Now, it, it, there was radio disruption on our planet four different times in that last week. And that was one of the things I said would also be a precursor. Look for an increase in radio disruptions. The longest one was 15 minutes on the sun-facing side. The last couple were one minute here for low-frequency radio disruption and uh, like 10 minutes for high. I'll leave a link for that at the bottom so you can check it out again. I'll just quit so you can go directly to that page. I'll save you the time of surfing through the site. It's very confusing, and a lot of these you have to go through several windows to find the information. And I'm not very smart, so yeah, you are I, smart. so I appreciate that. All right, Jason Woodring, 37 years old. I, he's got to live in the South somewhere. For he, he believes what you do, and he's going to disconnect his house. Or because you, you're going to build a Faraday cage, you're going to talk about that. But this guy, Jason, was going to disconnect his house and he caused a heck of a. They're going to make movies about guys, comedies about guys trying to protect their house from this ice on. But he, he's in big trouble, Jason, right? Right. He was trying to disrupt the entire grid at the 115,000 kilovolt line level. I was talking specifically just about your home. When you have a large cable that comes in to power a neighborhood, there's going to be junctions off of that, and one of those 
off the large cable will feed into your home, which is a smaller cable. What I was talking about was disconnecting your house from the grid. But remember, there's no way for you to disconnect the neighborhood level at the box. So you're going to be working with live electricity, which is very scary at that level coming into your house. So you need to be incredibly cautious. But that's what I'm talking about, a fire break between the any kind of line coming into your house that could be overcharged, jump a breaker, jump a fuse, and then get in and go down the smaller little wires in your house to your sockets. I think we should try to find Jason Woodring and do a three-way with him. Well, he was arrested on federal charges for taking down, again, the power grid, trying to uh, wire across. See, the this is this is what's going to happen. This is what I'm trying to prevent. So I'm, I'm talking to you about this. You think that a Faraday cage is the way to go. What the hell is a Faraday? Is it free? Do I have to buy one? Well, you need to buy some, oh. copper, some copper net mesh wiring. All right. That's it. You can find that at any local hardware store. Seven, right? Not not 7-Eleven. Not 7-Eleven. Okay. All right. Hardware now we store. we food within a day, though. All right. Okay. Hardware store. You make a cage. You make a cage. Uh, you need to make it the size that you want to protect everything that you have. Okay. So we have a 35-inch plasma screen TV. You're going to have to make a cage large enough to encompass that. How about so we have to car? disconnect everything. How about for your car as well? Ugh. So we have to disconnect everything in our house, complete, and then put it in this box, and then afterwards put it back up again. Wow. That's right, but you should have some warning in advance. It'll be a major, major, super huge, gigantic thing that the Carrington event was visible with the naked eyes when it happened in 1859. So if something as large, you would definitely be able to see it visibly with your eyes unless you're in a cloudy location. I bet the clouds would illuminate even more where something funky would happen in the sky where you would notice that it was brighter just through the cloud layer, too. There would be some sort of sign. All right, I'm back to being skeptical. Somebody actually gave me a question to ask you. So if this thing is strong enough to fry my computer while it's off, why wouldn't it fry my brain? You keep thinking it's a good thing or potential bad thing for computers, but I'm going to put foil around my head and walk around with that to protect myself. See, I think I'm taking better precautions than you are. Well, foil, that's not going to work. Why? I bet you Jason would say yes. Everything in the universe is frequency and vibration. Everything from how vibration can heal, everything is frequency. Natural earth energies are frequency. We are frequency. Our brains are frequency. Everything's frequency. If it vibrates higher, it's very possible that there could be some corridor or conduit in our brains that would open up that would allow us to see things a little bit differently during this time. So we could become smarter. Depends if you are into absorbing information. Is that corridor of your brain open, yes or no? And are you willing to accept new information? We're now in the first week of November. What are we going to see in the next 10 days? Now, since everything is vibration and frequency, you'll start to notice things vibrating differently, vibrating at a higher level because there's more influx, plasma, protons, electrons, electricity, whatever you like to call it. There's more of it in the air. So you'll notice people behaving differently. Possibly your animals you've noticed in the last week have behaved very strangely. This is what I'm talking about, the vibration of everything going to a higher level. Now, will that, in turn, like you were talking about the human mind, will this open a corridor or a conduit that allows us to think differently during this particular time? And the last thing would be during the conjunction of Mercury, the Sun, and Kabat Ison coming up, November 15th, you would expect a large plasma filament to come from the sun, connect to Mercury, and then from Mercury, that plasma filament connected electrically to Comet Ison would then jump and arc back to the comet, which already has an incredibly long tail. So you would see something, a plasma filament erupt from the sun that's incredibly long that connects to Mercury, out to Comet Ison, and then out further off the tail there. We're talking 60, 70 million miles of, of plasma Look for strange things in the sky. If you see something where you thought your eyes weren't working right, where you saw a flash of maybe a blue color or a pink color or any kind of color that you see, and you're like, did I just see that? You did. That's what I'm talking about. Electrical phenomenon. If if the uh, ISON con, I don't really know if it is, if the ISON comet is going to affect the Earth, how can we help somebody to prepare for it? And if it's practical advice, I'll probably even follow it. 
Think about the preparation you might have for a blizzard or for a typhoon or hurricane that would come for those of you living along coastal areas or mountain areas. How long, what would you prepare in advance? Water, some food, some lighting, uh, for seven days to 15 days off the grid with no electricity supply. What would you do and how would you cook your food as well? Think about everything in the cities or whatnot uses electricity to pump the water, so eventually the water would run out within your faucets and taps. Or All right, crime would go up. The toilet. And usually during blackouts, crime increases. Be less police force, cameras would be down. There'd be no lighted areas, right? It would just be dark areas. Criminals, if they if they were to believe you or the, the, the bad elements in the world could prepare for this and take advantage of the unprepared. And how would they prepare? They would probably garner more food and water themselves because they could last longer if they had more guns. Watch what I'm saying. They would do exactly what you're saying now. They would do exactly what I'm saying. In advance of maybe having an opportunity to pillage. But this is where knowing your neighbor comes back in really, really handy. Now, let's say you don't know your neighbors. You live in a big city. It could be anywhere in Asia. It could be anywhere in the United States, Europe. You know, how many people really know their neighbors that live in an apartment complex? You should really start to get to know some of your neighbors around. It's a shame that we don't know our neighbors the way our grandparents used to. They knew everybody on the city block. They knew every kid by name, all the parents. You don't even know your next door neighbor in the city. How are you supposed to help as a single individual? You have to come together. Like your bandits you're talking about, they're not going to come into neighborhoods where they know the neighborhood's banded together. That's because they prepared. I'm thinking the, the, easier targets, the evil place that. will go people that uh, have not prepared. And they'll go to those are the easy targets, people who did not prepare. All right, so we need candles, we need batteries, we need food and water for 17 days? I don't know. Think about a hurricane or typhoon. What's the longest one that you can remember where people went without food or had problems taking care of themselves? You know what this is, if I might be the skeptic. As well, you know, some places are cut off remote Pakistan. There are weeks without anything. This is exactly like Armageddon. Armageddon, not even. That has some sort of impact with the Earth. I'm only talking about electrical interaction with the Earth from the comet to the sun. And that's a huge difference between an impact and an electrical interaction that fries some of the circuitry and power grids on our planet. At least for a short time, maybe permanent damage. We just don't know. Because it just depends on how excited the sun can become. And it's been there's been X-45 flares before that they've measured. And the one that just popped off the sun, the last four, were like X-2.1. Right around two or low twos down. But they were still considered X flares. Imagine something 20 times more powerful that's directed directly here. And then wraps around part of the earth exactly on a power grid somewhere. Bzz, yeah. That's going to go down. Now, all this is in the event of the comet surviving its trip around the sun. Once it gets around the sun, all of these things that I'm talking about take action. Right now is sort of the calm before the storm. What you see going from now until November 28th, that's the precursors, the events before the storm. After it rounds the sun, if it survives its trip, pulling back toward Earth, it's going to be ripping all that CME and all that sun-ejected plasma toward the Earth, pulling it electrically, directing it to us and our magnetic field lines for the whole month of December. That'll be 30, 60, 90 direct hit flares. Like how, much can, how much can the Earth's magnetosphere protect from that if it's just one after another after another? It requires a little recovery time until those magnetic field lines bounce back and reconnect. A trip around the sun means that you need to start preparing to get ready for the Category 5 electrical typhoon that's about to pass the eye of it over the Earth is the equivalent if that comet survives the trip around the sun. This is an add-on. After our interview, a couple people had asked, uh, do you mean this is the end of our civilization as we know it or parts of it? And the answer was, no, it's not. What I'm trying to explain is that the elephant is now in the room. Comets? Specifically, this comet that we're watching, I'm trying to show the electrical nature of the comet by the interaction with the sun. If this is true and proven as theory and fact, instead of all this conjecture where people are unwilling to accept these ideas that comets have electrical influences with other bodies in space, and they can no longer discount it where they must start now experimenting with ways to pull electricity from space, but this throws everything in disarray that our society is based on and the way commerce operates. We operate on oil and gas now. If we substitute that instantly with electrical current pulled from space, this is going to create a problem not only garnering taxes that we pay when we pay our monthly electricity bill 
all these types of things are going to decimate the stock market and the uh, commerce system as we know it. But now the idea of electric comets is so in your face, and this comet's going to prove everything about electrical conduits in space, Birkeland currents, plasma discharges, effects on our planet, coronal hole effects creating earthquakes everything's electrically connected and this is the single pivot point of civilization where the world was flat last week and when this comet comes through the world will be round suddenly and everything you've ever known about electrical generation renewable power the way things operate in space they'll all have to be rethought rewritten all of our history books will have to be rewritten Everything will have to be rewritten starting from now. We are entering a new era. The comet's going to prove it, and that's what the videos are pretty much about. Hello, everyone. I wanted to show you some interesting information I just found regarding the Comet Ison debris field. Apparently, uh, through close observation by Russell over at BP Earthwatch, he noticed an actual exposure of the debris field by a CME, kind of like a spotlight that was shot out from the sun that could exposed it. And you can see that it's a big field of debris with planet-sized pieces of chunks in it. And uh, it's not something that we want to really ignore. Um, anyways, just wanted to show this to you and get it out there. So I hope you enjoy this little mini presentation update from December 4th and 5th regarding the common ice on debris field. A lot of people think that it's dust. This is proof it's not. And uh, I'm not really worried that it's going to really hit us directly, but we are going to get something or we're going to see something in the skies, apparently in the Orion comet, uh, sorry, the constellation and the Pleiades area, and according to Plasma Dave uh, around the North Star. So I'm not really up on all that information. However, I would like to uh, keep everybody informed. And of course, you may have noticed that Plasma Dave has had a couple of really good new videos. You should check them out. I'll put those in the links below. Uh, keep checking out. There's about 10 videos, so check them all out. And please subscribe. Bye. As you know, and as you've seen already, Comet Ison broke apart, fragmented at perihelion. But keep an eye on it. There's something really interesting with the pattern of the way it's flying by and going to pass the North Pole, especially if you take a look at Stellarium. Go to the last weeks of December, and if you press play and fast forward a little bit, you'll notice that Ison has a particular pattern in the sky revolving around Polaris, the North Star. If you were from the ground, it would appear as if that debris field or whatever it is now would spin in the sky in the exact same spot for several weeks. Taking into account that it is a fragmented cometary body, the Chinese divided their sky into, into five great regions. They're called Gong. Now these are equated with the north, south, east, and west directions. The middle direction is the North Star itself. That is the throne of the emperor, the house of the emperor. The other cardinal directions, if you will, if you have this star map that I have on the screen in front of you, you actually need to cut that out and turn it upwards so you're looking at the sky where the throne of the emperor covers the north star. Now you're going to notice the black tortoise, it's called Xuan Wu, and the blue dragon is termed as Qinglong, and the red bird is Ju Chue, and when we see on the what would be considered the right, the Bai Hu, the white tiger. All of these regions have a different effect on the Earth depending on where the comet transits through that star map. The Chinese are shitting themselves. The central government is actually probably terrified that this cometary fragment body or the comet itself or whatever's left, the pieces are going to circle through the throne of the emperor. And it, for 5,000 years, when it sits in the house of the throne, whenever comets reside in a house, specifically the throne of the emperor, the imperial court changes, leadership changes, overseership changes. They know what the sky map is about right now. And this brings me right to the legend of Ho Yi. In previous times, it's a mythological Chinese archer. 
This story was supposedly started around 2170 BC when there were 10 suns that appeared in the sky. The earth became incredibly hot and the king looked for a solution to this and a nobleman came down, took out his bow and arrow and shot nine suns with nine arrows. That was definitely a commentary fragment. It's just related in a different way. You know, they didn't have SDO telescope or SOHO to take a look up into the skies and, you know, throw the internet and explain it to everybody. Legends and myth and passed down stories were the way they did it. Now, the tapestry that you see from the Western Han Dynasty shows the nine suns in the right corner. You'll always see Ho Yi depicted as shooting his arrow at bird-like creatures or whatever they are in the sky. It's always something that's bird-like. And if we take a look through quickly here in the middle of November, the Earth-based as well as the space-based telescopes. Take a look at these. They look remarkably similar to a bird. Does this have something to do with what they saw first that created the, the fragments that needed to be shot down? If it is, then we are going to see something incredible coming up around Christmas time. Chinese have been studying comets for around 3,500 years. There's something you might want to take a look at called the Mawang Dui Silk. And it's, it was created around circa 300 BC, but the actual record keeping for the different comets that they have in their collection and archives of visual sightings through the heavens uh, began about 3,500 years ago. Ison did fragment in its transit around the sun. This next set of images is from Jesse over at BP Earthwatch. I appreciate your videos that I watch all the time. There's detailed analysis on what they look like, what's the inner coma, what's inside there now, what do those fragments look like. He d does a great job at, at bringing these out with different color changes. These four are exactly what's in there now. If you Now if these do spark, start to spread out in a shotgun pattern, these things will start to resemble what you saw with Shoemaker Levy 9 back in 1994 when it screamed through the sky out near Jupiter. But take a look at how that could easily be interpreted as a myth or a legend if you were to see that in the sky. How would you describe that if we had no internet? That would be Ho'i shooting something like that out of the sky. So the legend of Ho'i always flows back to the commentary fragments. I really believe this is, it's a fragment event that was described in the heavens. Now this is interesting. At the exact same time, when we start talking about the birth of Christ the, 2,000 years ago, Notice that the Stellarium also shows that same star body, Ison, revolving around Polaris. Now, if these three wise men were following a star, I guarantee it was no planetary conjunction when Jupiter lined up with Saturn, with Mars. Those are three tiny little dots in the sky that are moving. They're not stationary for weeks or months at a time. Right in December, I can't believe the timing on it, December 26th is when this will kick off and it'll start to spin and stay in the sky for weeks in the exact same place. Now, if it's cometary bodies, and we're looking at something like Shoemaker Levy with 24 different separate comets coming through in the same spot in the sky for three weeks. Uh, that's going to be special and people would definitely follow that. And it's not going to be just some tiny little Jupiter alignment with Saturn or whatever they said that it was back many millennia ago. It was something very special in the sky. These people were more in tune with their natural surroundings than we will ever be unless you live and you take that kind of lifestyle. For us to judge them and say, oh, they were just talking about planets or whatnot is is actually kind of demeaning. They were far greater in tune with our natural environment than we are. So I believe their story is more than our own right now. So keep your eyes on Comet Ison. I think there's two ancient myths and stories about to collide at the same time in the heavens above us, beginning November 26th, that we will witness. It's going to be an exciting time. Thanks for watching. Good afternoon, everyone. As we look at ancient history, You'll notice there's two things that span all cultures, all times, and are ingrained within the fabric of society itself. The one is the flood myth worldwide. The other is the phoenix, something rising out of the ashes that was burned and created new life and becomes a mythical being. Somehow a celestial object is eaten by flames and then reborn into a new light, marking the beginning of a new era. The ancient Egyptian phoenix termed Bennu. You notice the green circle on the on the top of the head that represents what I think is something with a coma around a comet. Hindu mythology refers to it as Garuda. The ancient Arabian phoenix also exists. When we come to the North American tribes, they also had the firebird legend in the sky. That was not lightning, please. 
the ancient phoenix from China itself turned Feng Huang is about rebirth. Now let's take a look at some satellites here. Follow along. You can see after Ison exited the sun, it has a distinct debris pattern that is holding together. It is spreading though, but it is holding together. Notice as it flies out, I'll give you some closer looks here. Watch the arrow, as you can see, going around. That's actually the coronal mass ejection hitting the back of that thing and lighting it up. This is the uh, Sechi HI-1. As we can take a look through here, the debris trail, very, very, very distinct. That rock is not three miles wide or five kilometers. That is impossible. And this is what's left over of a three mile wide rock, according to NASA, flying through space, millions of miles from the sun, holding together in its own trajectory and pattern. But that thing was only three miles of just dust, apparently, to NASA. I don't believe that. A t close up starts to resemble sort of, I don't know, something poking out of there ahead. I don't know, a jet, maybe a beak of a mythical reigniting electrical universe reconnecting the comet charge back to the sun. Here's another black and white view so you can see the uh, contrast a little bit better. Zoom in on that for you there. Three mile wide rock that broke apart? I don't think so. That's that's at least five million miles wide itself there. All right, this is comet I saw on entering the sun. This is Lasco C3, the blue filter. Now notice something, the filament, the plasma filament that's actually reaching off the sun to try to connect to that comet. This thing does remind of some serpents, dragons in the heavens, and I did a video on that about a month and a half ago, calling that these plasma filaments would jump off as the comet neared the sun. Now here we are. This is Lasco C3, the red filter. Watch as it comes around, and whoosh, it sort of turns into some sort of, it looks like, winged being. Now, how would an ancient society describe this? All right, here we come. This is Lasco C3, blue filter. Come around again, whoa, and there you get the wings and that kind of spray out effect. Causing the coronal mass ejections, you cannot tell me though that is not an electrical influence from the comet on the sun. Here's a slowed down version of it. Three satellites are taking these different angles, but you can see it's very distinct that that is holding together as a pattern. Here's the uh, core 2A and B. Again, as it exits the sun, it has that flare out pattern. At the same exact time, this incredibly rare V rainbow occurred in the skies. Same shape as what we're seeing with the debris pattern of ISON. Now, BP Earthwatch does a great job jumping in, uh, using his color saturation to show you the pieces that remain inside this debris field. Some of those are quite large. Those are hundreds of miles across, not three miles. When we see this same picture, it starts to resemble something pulling out, being reborn. The sun is in the center. It has something to do with the sun. The ancient legends from the Chinese have to do with the sun. Now, in China, as well as Asia, the body of the phoenix symbolizes six celestial objects within the heavens, if you will. The head of the phoenix represents the sky. The eyes are the sun. The back is the moon. The wings are the wind. The feet are the earth. And the tail are the other planets circling around. The, the feathers are different types of colors. There's black, white, red, blue, and yellow. And these all depict celestial body movements through. Now, why would an ancient culture put a mythical icon that mimics the heavens. Obviously, they were talking about something coming through, something to notice that was different. Something happened in the heavens in the way that they could pass down stories and traditions was through either oral or written, but it had to be such a special thing that it had to be a mythical creature to explain it. And I bet if we had the JPL orbital diagrams or something that went back that far, we could probably find another comet that fit the same bill. If we had satellites 8,000 years ago, let's say something in the Hongshan Neolithic period, if we had Lasco C2, I'm sure we would have seen what they're talking about. Even in Japan, their phoenix Ho'oh, also look at the cometary types of tails in the skies. Yuan Dynasty showing the same thing. Now, we're coming to the cometary encyclopedia, but look at the very bottom one where it says figure one. That definitely looks like a rooster head, some type of bird head coming off of there. Come on, there's too many coincidences with the shape of these things. Now, when we come to Comet Holmes, this is my my proof to you that comets can reignite themselves if a coronal mass ejection were to were to touch it there's an electrical connection in our universe it's called the electric universe there's Birkeland currents flying through space and Comet Holmes is a perfect example it's a it's an orbital comet it comes around again and again not too close to the Sun but this was on its way out to Jupiter on the way out and it reignited and had this large coma. That coma was larger than our own sun. It became the largest thing in the solar system itself. My thoughts on this are that as the remains, the debris field of Ison, march past the conjunction between Mercury, the Earth, 
there's a magical line right there. It's a reignition line, if you will. And that is going to go out to another conjunction that happens on the 16th. So during this time, from the 8th to the 16th, there's a high probability that individual pieces within the coma will reignite, gain their own tails, and start to have their own comas again. This will go right along with the Phoenix myth. Something went into the nest of the sun, burned, and reemerged again. But this time it will be more of a string of pearls type of thing with each one of these objects becoming its own comet-like body. Just as Shoemaker Levy 9 in 1994, that string of pearls effect. We'll see something very similar to that. And the phoenix is reborn. Modern day, how do you explain it? And one last thing, almost all the depictions of phoenix show something radiating from the head. Now if you look at that, and you just saw all the things I just showed you on this video, that is a coma coming off of a comet. They were trying to use mythical legend to, to show cometary movements in the sky. And again, beyond mythical legend, how about into our modern science legend of snowballs in space? Come on. The electric comet model's definitely been proven by this transit of the sun for, from ice on. All the, the CMEs that occurred during that time, how many were there? Seven? You cannot tell me when a, that comet caused so many CMEs to come off the sun as it rounded it. This is uh, the electric comet model. And it will demonstrate an electrical field again between the debris of ice on and the sun, causing the reignition somewhere between December 8th and December 16th. For those of you with your eyes on the skies, here's a sky map for December 9th, showing what's on the horizon. Appreciate you watching. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to talk today a little bit about plasma experiment similarities and the pictures we've seen from Earth-based telescopes during the passing of Comet Sighting Spring and the possible electrical interaction with Mars. Since the passing of Comet Siding Spring on October 19th, within a few hundred thousand kilometers of Mars, an Earth-based telescope picked up an anomalous event and looked like an electrical plasma discharge onto the planet. This is a color enhanced red so you can see the hourglass shape along with the periphery X that seems to trail off. And my thought was, if it is actually a plasma event and this is connected to the electrical universe, there should be some similarities that we've replicated on our experimental laboratories here on our own planet. The mass reactor, look how very similar that is to what was just shown in that. It has the hourglass shape with the periphery arms coming off both north and south limb. Cornell University replicated the exact same shape phenomenon in the zeta pinch, uh, otherwise known as z-pinch. Notice the same shape again with Texas A&M and Sandina National Laboratory. These are where the filaments rotate and pinch back on themselves in the magnetic field. Just so you didn't forget what shape you're looking for, here it is, that hourglass. Again, at a slightly different experiment at Cornell University, yielding the same exact shape. When you look at dipolar magnetic plasma fields, you start to see that same shape. Spherical torus yields the same results. The array parameters on properties in rotating plasma fields, depending on the metal of the wire, the shape's the same. It comes with that X coming off the limbs there. A closer in look at the spherical torus from Callum in the UK. I did find a conceptualization of what Birkeland currents are and how they pinch on the filaments during star formation. Now most persons in academia do agree on at least one thing, that plasma is scalable to any size, galactic size down to the nanometer size. So let's take a look at a galactic example. This is the Triangulum Galaxy. Again, you notice that same hourglass X shape. One of the reasons I really wanted to bring this up was the electrical universe. This is just another proving point. Is there free electricity around us? Is there any other way to harvest and consolidate electricity for our own uses on this planet? And the thought process going down the road as our planet increases the population, electrical needs will need to be met. This event on Mars, plasma discharge, is just another indicator that the electric universe is a true idea and needs to be experimented on more and more money needs to be allotted for our testing laboratories to do exactly what Nikola Tesla did in 1897. Here's a couple of patents for you to look deeper in to see what type of wireless transmission 
devices that were on the books back then over a hundred years ago. I encourage you to take a deeper look into what I've just shown you. This is just scratching the surface. I'm not a plasma physicist. The real masters of this are Donald Scott, Wallace Thornhill, and David Talbot. You can check out their work at Thunderbolts. I'm going to leave the comment box open so we can continue the conversation. I encourage you to leave a note. Thanks for watching.